Hi, uh, welcome back. This is class seven of the S1 series for uh, VATSIMS training for controllers. Uh, this is class seven is on major clearance delivery. You, if you've completed class one through six, you should already have done your knowledge check and be training for the uh, minor airports. That's uh, all the from the uh, you know, the the Gulf Delta Charlie airports. Uh, and uh, this is only for the Class Bravo Airport. We only have one in Orlando. Uh, we don't have any other in the Jacksonville Artec except Orlando. <clears throat> so uh, you need to complete Class 7 and Class 8 before you do your sweat box uh, training and over the shoulder in order to do delivery and uh, ground control in Orlando. So if you're doing this expecting to continue your minor, you can stop and come back to this after you've finished your uh, over the shoulder training for minor S1. Uh, we'll be going over the introduction to the, to the airport. Uh, the uh, TRACON is called F-11. And so we don't consider Orlando TRACON, we call it F-11. Uh, we'll talk about the SIDs that are available right now in Orlando. This is going to change in a couple of months, and that'll this video will change as a result. Uh, if you've completed this video and you get your rating before we switch to the Metroplex, then you'll only need to complete the in-service and there will be a short video to do the in-service so that you don't have to go through the entire series. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, you'll be instructed to do the long video if you haven't got here yet. Uh, we'll do IFR initial altitude assignments and departure frequencies, VFR procedures, and scratch pad entries. So Orlando International Airport is the 12th busiest in the country in the real world. And it's the third largest by size with 13,000 plus acres. Uh, right now it's divided into two complexes. Uh, what you see on the top right is the west complex. So west is going to the top right corner. East is going to the bottom left corner. You can only see uh, runways. This is a little confusing for pilots that the 1-8 runways are on the west complex, and there's a 1-8 right, 1-8 left, and it's corresponding 3-6 left, 3-6 right. Uh, on the east complex, 1-7 uh, right and 3-5 left is close to the terminals, and there's a bit of a separation uh, to 1-7 uh, left and 3-5 right. <clears throat> so we also have a... Uh, uh, cargo area down here. Uh, there's a UPS that's off the screen, and these are all the various FBO ramps and support ramps for general aviation uh, over here on the West Complex. Uh, we have a couple of uh, taxiways that go back and forth to get between the East and West Complex. There's three of them. Uh, we'll talk about those, and uh, we'll go over some of the basic clearance that's associated here. And then in the next class, we'll go over how how the uh, taxiways are oriented for ground control. I'll pause, uh, continue on and tell you there's there's a heliport right here at the very center of the terminal. Uh, I presume that's for VIPs in the real world. Uh, most of the medical uh, uh, helicopters will either land on the West Complex or go up to Orlando Executive just north of the field uh, for their services. There's a, a series of... Uh, highways. So on the south end, there's a highway down here that comes up and people uh, drop in and off at the south complex, but they can they can swing around and easily enough and get to the north complex. They, uh, uh, they have to swing quite a bit around actually to get there and come back in. There's only one entryway on the other end, the south end here, and then this north end comes a way out uh, to for the traffic. And they in, in order to get to each of the gates in the real world, there are uh, autonomous uh, trams that run back and forth along these tracks uh, to each of the airfields. So let's talk about clearance in the Class Bravo airspace. Uh, it might be easier to pull this up in Sky Vector or uh, uh, Navarro to, to look at it there. The uh, there are strict requirements, of course, in the Class Bravo. We've gone over that in the previous airspace discussions. Uh, you should already remember how that works. Uh, <clears throat> but the important fact is to notice that there's a lot of uh, Class Deltas inside the Bravo. So uh, we have uh, 
<clears throat> we, we have Orlando Executive that's right under the departure or arrival for the uh, 18 runways, and they typically take off to the east. So the departures going to the east off Executive are right under the east complex arrivals departures as well. Uh, you have Kissimmee over here, and this is a very busy field in the real world because it's very close to the attractions. So uh, the top one percenters who want to go to the attractions come into Kissimmee and then get their limousines out to their fancy hotels. Uh, we have Sanford up here, which is the, the uh, base for Allegiant. So both in Vatsim and the real world, that's a very busy uh, airport. Apopka is not very busy. Uh, it's a favorite for people in seaplanes, but we don't see that too much in VATSIM. Uh, for what it's worth, there's a seaplane base down here at what they call Lake X. And due west of that, about, uh, let's see if I can find it, about here, yeah, uh, right by this uh, private field is where I live in the real world. So I enjoy excellent uh scanner coverage of the field and uh, whenever we're doing north ops i enjoy seeing all the aircraft uh, making the turn to base to go into land on the east complex uh, <clears throat> f-11 departure transition areas uh, these look like they're a lot they're not that complicated understand that departure transition areas are not departure gates uh, there are areas, and there there are areas where fixes are located for exiting. Uh, <clears throat> so, and there's really it's really not that hard to figure out. <clears throat> Virtually everyone going to the north and northeast is going to go out the Worms Gate. Uh, Guano Fix is right next to here, so uh, our two uh, departures, uh, McCoy and Jag, both use Guano. So you have. McCoy and Jag going out here, and then you have uh, uh, the Orlando 4 using worms going out here, and then for props you have uh, citrus that comes out uh, through Mickey. But anywhere in this area is, is a DTA, and it's a pretty busy DTA, and that matters because you have to separate the aircraft as they go out for uh, radar control. Anything going to the west, and because Florida is so far to the east of the country, there's a ton of aircraft that go out to the west. So Camden is a very, another very busy DTA. Uh, the prop equivalents are Need and Vista. Need takes them down towards uh, Tampa. So typically they'll be at lower altitudes, like maybe 12,000 or less going to Tampa. Uh, and for Vista is for going up to Ocala, Gaines, uh, and uh Pensacola or Tallahassee for the props going out that way. Uh, and this is the West Gate. We have one small gate here at Kilman. <clears throat> and Kilman is really just for Sarasota, Fort Myers, uh, and uh, points on the, on the peninsula on the west side. And all of the Miami and uh, Bahamas and uh, anything to the southeast and, and mo <clears throat> most of the east side of South America, we're going to come out of the Atlas Gate. Uh, again, you have the Atlas Gate, and then you have the props for Tipster and Cusser, but this whole area is considered uh, the large gate. Typically, we'll be using Atlas, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in terms of what folks need, because typically, the, the rules for going out Atlas are slightly different than they are, because this is you know, all in the Miami RTAC. <clears throat> oh, and then the ones in green are arrivals. And basically what you're seeing here as a result is uh, the way th air traffic is separated in Orlando is both by altitude and by the arrival gate versus the departure gate. That, that uh, by following this pathway, aircraft are, are easily separated in their flight plan. <clears throat> so what you need to know is those gates. So that image you'll probably want to keep around to look at. Uh, and this little chart, uh, which is available from your mentor instructor, uh, or you can just you can just copy copy here on the screen. You'll want to know these DTAs <clears throat> and what they re are associated with in the fixes, uh, because when you see it on the flight plan, it may not always be obvious that they're on the Orlando for turbojet props or the Citrus for pistons. Uh, 
the inst the instructions vary on the initial altitude of force for pistons versus turbojets, but there's in concept it's the same, so it makes it very easy uh, to understand the DTAs once you get used to where those fixes are. <clears throat> Standard uh, SIDS for departure. Again, this is <clears throat> actually really very easy. The McCoy and JAG are only used for, uh, are, are limited to turbojets and turboprops. So anybody not going out the north gate will go on the Orlando 4 SID. That's simple enough. Uh, if there, So it's either going to be McCoy, JAG, or the Worms DTA for Orlando 4. And if any of the commercial aircraft that don't have McCoy or JAG, they have to be reassigned the Orlando 4 and given the Worms uh, uh, DTA. <clears throat> For every other commercial aircraft going out, they're all going to be on the Orlando 4, and they're going to be one of those gates, either the West Gate, the South Gate, the Southeast Gate, or the North Gate. So it's really quite simple. For the Pistons, it's even simpler. There's one and only one departure, and it goes to the gates. It goes to the DTAs. Again, uh, Vizda, Kilman, Need, Tipster, or of course Worms. So it's the DTAs we have right now and the SIDS we have right now are very simple. When we go to the Metroplex, it's actually, once you read all the Metroplex uh, departures, it's not much more complicated. The real difference is that uh, the Metroplex departures are runway specific and they all have an RNAV uh, waypoint. But it turns out when you look at them, <clears throat> they're doing almost the same thing as these departures are. Uh, they're just completely uh, pilot controlled departures. So the McCoy said, and we'll look at this and then the JAG, and you're going to see that it's almost the same thing. Uh, the McCoy departure, they're all going to come out and they're going to you somehow get to the Orlando VOR and then their pilot controlled to Guano. I'm pointing that out because uh, <clears throat> you're going to see Guano is also in the JAG departure. So they need to be above 3,000 feet when they cross the Orlando VOR, and that's because the Orlando VOR is right at Orlando Executive, and Orla Orlando Executive is airspace uh, in the class Delta below it. Uh, a typical example is going to say McCoy 2, Guano, and then wherever they're going. So you read that clearance as uh, what they had in the bottom. American 431 Orlando clearance cleared to Washington Reagan Airport via the McCoy 2 departure. Guano then is filed. <clears throat> All the turbo props and jets get 5,000. Maintain 5,000. Expect flight level 37010 set departure. The departure frequency is 124.8, and that's true for Jacksonville all the time, uh, Squawk 0701. The only time you won't use 124.8 is when there is no TRACON online and you're sending them to directly to center. Uh, but that turns out to be, during events, that's the departure frequency. During non-events, that's the main frequency. So uh, you'll, always be, you'll almost always be using 124.8. <clears throat> <clears throat> and as you know, you know, I'd expect the first maintain altitude is the same as the top altitude of the departure. JAG-6, no surprise, it's exactly the same thing. Okay. It's going out, making a turn. It's going to be over 3,000 Orlando, uh, going to Guano, and then on to Mateo. Now, for the, uh, or for the F-11 Tracon, Mateo is outside the airspace. So when, if you're, if you're uh, working up to Tracon, we still always give them direct to Guano, and then they go on. We don't give them direct Mateo unless we get that cleared through the center controller. <clears throat> In this case, Southwest 2236, Orlando clearance, clear to the Columbus airport. JAG-6 departure, Mateo then is filed. Maintain 5,000, expect flight level 3010 minutes after departure. Departure frequency 124.8, Squawk 0702. And then, yes, we gave them Mateo, but when the Jacksonville departure Tracon is online, again, they will give them this interim fix of Guano. 
the Orlando 4 is for everybody else, right? <clears throat> so uh, everybody who's a TurboJet Turbo Prop will get this if they didn't file one of those other two sets. And there's a whole bunch of VORs that they can have as an initial fix, uh, but they might have another fix as long as the, the fix is within the uh, F-11 airspace, which is pretty large, uh, it'll be fine. What you want to do, however, is figure out what their DTA is and put that into the flight plan. So <clears throat> in this case, this person is going to Minneapolis, which, is, which goes out to Camdit or West DTA. So we add the Camdit uh, DTA in the route and we put it in the scratch pad for C. And what that does is allow the folks who are using VSTARS to control, their software will pick up uh, the fact that it's Camdit and it will uh, put the appropriate scratch pad entry in. Uh, you, you put it in VRC, but if it's not in there, VSTARS will figure it out and put it in for the controller, which is a very nice feature. Now, why do we have these, these three? Why do we have two that appear identical, uh, JAG and McCoy? Well, it turns out because uh, when we're in South Ops, which is the normal ops, the, uh, the JAGs will come out to the southwest and the coils will come out to the southeast and that gives some separation when they both when they all converge on that north DTA <clears throat> so uh, the only four DTAs in the Orlando 4 SID are the turbojet DTAs right they're not going to be using the, the piston DTAs so just the four up here Canada Kilman Atlas and Worms makes it real easy the pistons all get the Citrus 1. If it looks remarkably like the Orlando 4, that's because it is. The only difference now is that the uh, maintain altitude is 2,000 instead of 5,000. Otherwise, everything is pretty much the same. <clears throat> November 156, Romeo Papa, Orlando Clarence clear to Pensacola Airport. Uh, Citrus 1 departure, then it's filed, maintain 2,000. Expect 10,000, uh, 10,000, minutes after departure. Departure frequency 119.4, squawk 0703. Now, why do they have a different one here? Because, uh, actually, I don't know. Usually it's because uh, they're in split operations at, during an event or satellites uh, are going to be on it. Whatever that departure frequency is, typically it's one, still 124.8 because there's only one person on most of the time in the F-11 uh, airspace. So... Notice that for the Citrus 1, they will only get one of the five DTAs associated with Citrus 1. Initial assignments. <clears throat> like I said, all turboprops and turbojets get 5,000 unless they actually file below that. And all uh, IFR pistons get 2,000 also unless they file below that. Uh, the departure frequencies are defined by the uh, DTAs when we're in split operations. Uh, <clears throat> in reality, I hardly ever see this because if we have split operations, we usually split the arrivals and the departures can be pretty easily managed by one person. So I don't see the departure splits occurring that often. When they do, uh, you'll have to pay attention to that. VFR procedures are pretty straightforward. Uh, the frequencies are shown on the slide here, and they're also in the SOP. Uh, basic procedures on the ground, we talked about this in the, in the S1 minor training. Uh, you need to be cleared into the Class Bravo airspace, even if you're on the ground at Orlando. Uh, piston aircraft who are VFR maintain 1,500. Uh, turbojets at or below 5,000. And this is for VFR stuff, okay? Uh, <coughs> Now, if you're going to maintain VFR at or below 5,000, what's the actual altitude they'll be at? It'll probably be 4,500 or 3,500, right? Because of the direction of flight. Uh, the departure frequency and squawk the number. But the important part is to remember to clear them into the uh, class Bravo airspace. So the scratch pad entries right now are basically the first letter, unless it's taken, then it's the second letter. So Kilman takes the K, that's why Mead gets the N. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have a few others here letting people know they're going to a local airport or terminal in route. Uh, once we change to the new Metroplex, 
this is going to change to uh, through the first three letters of the departure. And that's it for uh, class seven for student one. I'll see you on class eight.